on a morning where no one had done any work on the network infrastructure whatsoever, the data center went down. So let me fill you in. This is a two data center operation processing payment cards. That is one of the data centers that would be involved if you swipe a card at a payment terminal and expect to get an approved or denied message to come back from your bank. One of the two data centers at this particular environment I worked at had gone down and was not able to process cards. The symptoms were uh, all of the CPUs, all of the control plane CPUs and all of the network devices were pegged at 100% and as a result routing adjacencies were failing between the core switches and other major routers in the environment. With the adjacencies going up and down we were sporadically getting traffic in but not consistently as you might imagine. A lot of packets were being dropped it would seem. Payments weren't being processed and we uh, ended up moving all of our traffic to the alternate data center and had to process everything on, uh, let's call it data center B. Data center A was not able to process transaction and we went into scramble mode to figure out what was going on. Aaron had asked me a question on one of my earlier videos, asking for a video describing a scenario where uh, things that I knew made me uniquely qualified to help solve the situation, and this was one of those days. At the end of the day, what had happened was a switch had crashed. This is a two, think about it as a two-tier uh, data center. We had access switches up in racks that were all plumbed straight back to where there was no ag layer. Uh, it wasn't exactly leaf spine because um, there were only two switches involved and they weren't even all able to forward traffic. It wasn't that kind of an environment uh, yet at that time. That was not a design. It was really a big layer two design as opposed to a layer three. And that's the crux of the issue that we were having right there. Let's go back to my switch that crashed. There was a switch in a rack, dual home, back to the core switches. When it crashed, rather than just dying, it continued to pump the same traffic, small little block of traffic over and over and over again. And if you plug Wireshark into the right port, you were able to see this, uh, that this was happening. It wasn't a lot, a lot of traffic. It was, again, a small block of Ethernet frames over and over again, some of which were broadcast frames which showed a flaw in the design where some of those broadcast frames were on our management VLAN and with the management VLAN was one of the very few in the data center that was everywhere. We had shared this management VLAN all the place because this was, we did not have an out of band the network. It wasn't an option for us back in the day. This goes back a lot of years before that was a commonplace thing to do. The broadcast frames that were on the management VLAN hit every switch, every router, uh, causing their CPUs to be overloaded with these broadcast frames that they had to pra uh, they had to process because they were broadcast frames, and you see where we ended up. Routing adjacency is not able to stay up because there wasn't enough CPU left over to do the things that were needful for routing protocols like keep up with hello uh, processes and, uh, and send out its own hello packets and so on to keep this EIGRP network up. Without, even though all the servers were on, everything was okay there and able to process, the network wasn't able to forward traffic in a consistent way and therefore the network was effectively down. Um, when we plugged Wireshark in and had found these the group of frames that were being repeated over and over again, we checked its bridging tables, figured out what rack it came from, shut the switch off, that it crashed, everything went back to normal very quickly. Weird problem, couldn't replicate it ever again, a fluke, I've never seen it before, had never seen it before, and have never seen that kind of a problem since, where a crash switch was at wire speed repeating a small chunk of traffic over and over again uh, into the network, very strange. Why was I a person uniquely able to help diagnose and resolve that problem? Because I had uh, been involved as a tech lead on building out that data center with a group of several other people I had designed that infrastructure and had rack by rack been building out switch configurations and testing them and, and so on as we moved into that data center a year or two earlier 
the moral of the story here, there is a lot to be said for having your hands on the equipment. Now, if you only ever do, say, architecture and design, you never actually touch the equipment, you know a lot if you uh, do architecture and design. It's important that you know a lot and you do know a lot, uh, but it's a little, you're it's still a step removed from being you know, what, what the engineer role is, where you're hands on with configurations and you understand exactly how a device is going to react when you type something in. I had both roles. I had design role and I had engineering role, which has been typical in my networking career where I've had to both design it and implement it, a pretty common thing, which gave me, kind of I was able to drill into the problem pretty quickly and, and rule out a lot of things I knew it wasn't, and then get down to what I knew that it was uh, through a process of elimination. I had to understand, looking at the Wireshark captures, that these, these frames that I'm seeing were being transmitted very quickly. I could tell that for Wireshark. I needed to know that it was a problem I could solve by looking at bridging tables, looking at uh, Mac-address-table and figuring out what the source of these uh, Ethernet frames were and then tracing them back to a source switch that was uh, sending them out. And that may not have happened had I not been involved in with the hands-on process of standing up these switch stacks. So hands-on really, really matters. Uh, doing things really, really matters. And it's the kind of experience that makes you a, a better engineer because you learn from those experiences. So let's tie this back into certifications of the previous, some of the previous talks that I've given. One of the things you don't get from certifications is that sort of knowledge. You don't get that sort of understanding and comprehension of the problem only through certs. Certs teach you the principles. It will teach you about bridging tables and how to look at them and what Ethernet bridging is and uh, unknown unicast flooding and you know, you'll learn a lot of those principles in your training, but it takes the deep understanding, diagnosing real problems to make it instinctual in your brain when troubleshooting a problem, know where to look and where not to look. You waste an awful lot of time in technology looking at where the problem isn't. Uh, with experience, you can quickly rule out certain things when a certain problem comes up if you're really familiar with the infrastructure. And every tech environment's got its own feel to it, its own rhythm. Certain applications that run across it cause certain patterns in the network. And you get a sense for what's normal and what's not, what's not by working with it every day. Um, and once you see enough of these different environments, you get a sense of, in a more broad spectrum, what's normal and what's normal. So you can take that knowledge and apply it to really any environment that you're working in. And that hands-on makes a difference.